The Old Testament reading comes from Habakkuk chapter 4 and chapter 2, parts of each. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower, and look out to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Please join me in reading Psalm 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He He alone alone is my rock and my salvation. salvation. My My fortress, fortress. I I shall shall not be greatly greatly shaken. shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. The only, the only plan, plan to thrust him, him down from his high position. They, they take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He, he only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. fortress. I, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust Trust in him him at all times, times, O people. people. Pour Pour out your heart heart before before him. him. God God is a refuge refuge for us. us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If the riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. And that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you are rendered to a man according to his word. The epistle lesson comes from 2 Timothy, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us the spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus, before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The Gospel lesson appointed for this Sunday is according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for another day. We thank you for the health that you've put into our bodies. We thank you, Father, that you've given us minds to think and that you've given us the ability to work and to enjoy the life that you've given us. Speak to us today, God, through your word. Help us to understand your word better so that we not only believe it, but put it into practice in our everyday lives so that we can be an immense blessing to the church and those around. Help us today, especially as we look at the topic of prayer. We need to be praying people. Prayer is powerful. And um, help us to learn how to pray aright. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> how often do we pray the Lord's Prayer mindlessly? I'm afraid oftentimes that the words come out of our mouths and our lips, but do we often think about what we are praying when we pray that very important prayer that the Lord gave to us? Most of us went to catechism or some sort of instruction or Bible class, and so we were taught the meaning of the introduction, the seven petitions, and the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. But we know that if we don't keep up with what we've been taught, if we don't refresh our minds regarding what we've been taught about the Lord's Prayer, it's easy to go by the wayside. So today, what I want to do is focus in on two just two of the seven petitions to the Lord's Prayer. I want to look at the first petition, Hallowed Be Thy Name. And I want to look at the fifth petition, Forgive Us Our Trespasses as We, have forgive, as we Forgive Those Who Trespass Against Us. Two very important petitions that we should be praying with our mind and hearts engaged. And so I hope that maybe after we have studied these two parts of the Lord's Prayer. When it comes time to pray the Lord's Prayer in the service, we can pray it more meaningfully. Before we get into some of the specifics of the petitions, though, have you ever wondered why you pray the Lord's Prayer in the first person plural rather than the first person singular? We pray Hallow are our Father who art in heaven. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. The first person plural rather than the first person, person uh, singular. Well, I think, first of all, that the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord of the church, um, set up worship for his church. And one of the aspects of worship and other um, integral parts of being the church is that the church doesn't exist in a vacuum. In other words, let me put it this way. God has not called individuals to be in simply a vertical relationship with him, to have faith in him, to simply pray to him singly, and worship him and serve him, but he's called us to be the church. And the word in the New Testament for church is ecclesia, the called out ones. So he's called us to be his children in a vertical relationship, but also to have a horizontal relationship with other believers, and so that we come and we pray together, we worship together, we partake of the sacraments together, we go out and preach the gospel and strategize together to uh, draw other people to know Jesus Christ. And so when we think of things that way, I think that's an explanation regarding the Lord's Prayer. Indeed, we pray it by ourselves in our daily devotions or at times, but also the Lord intended that the Lord's Prayer be a part of our corporate worship. So it's a good thing, I think, when the church retains that tradition of praying the Lord's Prayer together in our worship services. 
But as we think of the Lord's Prayer and other portions of Scripture, there is a Reformation principle that is very important, and that is Scripture interprets Scripture. So if there is an unclear portion of Scripture, or a portion of Scripture that maybe has an expanded meaning, what we do is we take cross-references, cross we may take a concordance, and we use clear uh, passages of Scripture to help explain less clear passages of Scripture. That's a Reformation principle of biblical interpretation. So that's kind of what I want to do today as we look at the first petition and as we take a look at the um, fifth petition. So let's go on to the next point. The first petition, hallowed be thy name. And this is the catechism explanation to uh, the first petition, or at least part of it. God's name is certainly holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. And the catechism goes on to say that God's name is kept holy among us when the gospel is preached in all of its pu truth and purity. So we retain true doctrine in our preaching, in our teaching, in the church, and we live holy lives according to the pure teaching that we receive from our pastors and our teachers. And then further, the explanation in the catechism goes on to say that when God's word is not preached purely, but mixed with false teaching, and when people do not live holy lives according to the word of God, then God's name is profaned among us. And then in uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, it says, Temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pure doctrine is necessary in the church so that God's name may be kept holy among us. But when God's word is not preached truthfully, we see all sorts of shenanigans in the church and in people's lives. And I think one of the false doctrines that the church has had to combat throughout its histories, throughout its history, is works righteousness, that insidious thought that through my own efforts, through my own quote unquote good works, what I think are good works, I can gain God's attention and ultimately get a place in heaven. That's a doctrine of demons. It's not taught in the Bible. But unfortunately, a lot of people who call themselves Christians and even find themselves in the assembly of believers think that way, together with a lot of people outside of the church. The true teaching of the Holy Christian Church derived from the Bible found in the writings of the church fathers and in the book of Concord and especially in the Bible has always been that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ that is the true teaching and remember it said here in this passage that I have up on the screen it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. So if we have a preacher um, standing up within Christendom or teaching in a Bible class this insidious doctrine of works righteousness, um, it would be better that that, per that that person, according to Jesus himself, had an a uh, millstone put around his neck and he were cast into the depths of the sea. 
God is that serious about true teaching and true doctrine. Because if the Bible is perverted, then precious souls that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus may be cast into perdition forever. And um, there's another false way of looking at things today. I think it's very, very popular. And I think it's brought a lot of people into ruin. And it's that thinking that my feelings, my preferences are the way I need to go when I make decisions. I would call it the idolatry of feelings. And we see that all around us today. People making decisions based on how I feel rather than what the Word of God says. Let me give you an example. I don't want to go to your church. It's boring. I want to go to the church down the street because they have real upbeat music. They've got a cool band. And the pastor is real hip. I think that's all the wrong reasons why we should or should not go to a church. It's not based on or should not be based on my superficial feelings, how a service makes me feel, um, the people that surround me at that service, or whether the pastor is hip or cool or not, should be based on what is being taught there. What is the doctrine there? Is it in conformity with the true word of God? Or is it at variance with the word of God? But we see way too many people making judgments and decisions about all sorts of things in their lives based on how I feel. It's the idolatry of self, the idolatry of feelings, and it's been used by the devil in the church and outside of the church in our culture today to the ruination of many, many lives. So, first petition, hallowed be thy name. God's name is hallowed in our lives, in our church. When we respect the written word of God, what does Paul call it in um, the epistle lesson that we wrote today? The pattern of sound teaching. When we exalt that rather than our own selfish thoughts and desires, God's name is truly hallowed. As we live our lives in the church, in community, in our family, we're surrounded by sin. Sin is all over the place. And there was a popular thought a while ago. I haven't heard it so much today. Have you ever heard of people talking about victimless crimes or victimless sins? So in other words, the thought is, um, I can do whatever I want just as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else around me. Fact of the matter is there are no victimless crimes. There are no victimless sins. Whatever you do that is at variance with the word of God, whether it's small or large, it does make an impression on the people around you, and it affects them sometimes very, very negatively. We might not see it that way, but that's the way God sees it. And so, the fifth petition... Fifth petition speaks to this, I believe. It speaks to sin in our lives and in the lives of people around us. It says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And part of the catechism explanation to this is we pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayers because of them. Excuse me. And um, Luke 17, 3 says, If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So we dare not take sin seri- uh, 
We dare not take it lightly. We should take it very, very seriously. When we fail to take sin seriously in the lives of others around us and just kind of turn a deaf ear to what they're doing or not doing, the Bible actually says we become participants in that person's sin. So we see someone who is engaged in self-destructive behavior or believing or thinking or doing something that is sinful and we don't intervene, the Bible says that we indirectly are participating in that self-destruction that's going on in that person's life. That's sobering in my mind. And we dare not downplay sin in our own lives. It's really easy to be able to... It's just a tendency that we all have. And Jesus picked up on that tendency when he was dealing with people. And we read about it in the Gospels. It's a real easy thing to be able to zero in on the sins of other people, but not to see our own sins. But when we downplay and embrace our own sins, it's like embracing a time bomb. And pretty soon, at some point, it is going to blow up in our faces. Sin is serious and it affects people and it affects us sometimes. Sometimes people sin against us. And what does Jesus say in the gospel lesson about how to deal with sin? He says, don't ignore it, but rebuke it, deal with it, call people out on sin. Of course, do it in a gracious and loving way, but Definitely deal with sin in your own life and in the lives of others. And it says, forgive sins. And that's the tough part. Sometimes it's real easy to call people out when they've sinned and to admonish them. But to forgive, oh, that's kind of difficult, especially when they've done something that we perceive has really impacted us negatively that's hurt us and we have a deep hurt inside or um, it has done something to someone in our family, it's hard to forgive. But Jesus says in the gospel lesson, if someone forgives you in one single day seven times and comes to you and says, I'm sorry that we're called upon as Christians to forgive that person, even up to seven times. And of course that word that number seven in the uh, Bible is a perfect term, so it doesn't mean simply seven times, but many, many times over and over again. There's a man by the name of Adolf Kors, Adolf Kors III. You know the name. You've probably drunk some of his products before. Um, I think his beer is pretty good myself. I've had some. Um, but in 1960, Adolf Kors III was kidnapped. He was taken hostage. He had a ransom put on his head. And of course, the police and his family went out looking for him and they could not find him. And ultimately, a month after his kidnapping, he was re or they found his body. And they ultimately found the person who killed him. His name was Joseph Corbett. He went to trial. He was convicted. And he resided in Colorado's Canyon City Penitentiary. But Adolf Kors III had a son by the name of Adolf Kors IV. And Adolf Jr., we'll call him, was very close to his father. And he said, he was not just my father, he was my best friend. And he was a teenager when his father was murdered. And it impacted him greatly. In fact, he was filled with rage and anger and bitterness over this man who murdered his father in cold blood and just left his body out to the elements. And he couldn't get over it, and he was just filled with wrath. But the rest of the story about Adolf Kors IV is that he became a Christian. He started studying the Bible. 
He started praying the Lord's Prayer. He prayed the fifth petition just about every day. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And as he prayed that prayer over and over again and read the Bible, he was under conviction himself that he was not following what God's word was prompting him to do. So one day he decided to go to the Cannon City Penitentiary in Colorado and visit his father's murderer. He set up an appointment. The man never showed up, but Adolf IV had a Bible with him, and he wrote a message to his father's slayer, and it said something like this. It said, I'm sorry you didn't make it to our appointment today, but I just wanted to ask for your forgiveness because for the last 15 years, I've been filled with hate and anger towards you. But now I want you to know that I have forgiven you. And we don't know whether that convict ever got the Bible, ever got the message that was given to him by Adolf IV. But the fact of the matter is, Adolf said that the only way he could forgive was through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ gave him the power to say those powerful words of forgiveness to someone that hurt him so badly. And that's the only way that we can put this prayer into effect in our own lives is through the blood of Jesus Christ. He laid down his life for you and for me. And the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So it's practically the same kind of situation as in that story that I just communicated to you. Unilaterally, without our even coming to him, God loved us so much that he sent his son who laid down his life for us and died for us and shed his blood. And so therefore, when we read the word, when we hear the gospel and receive the gospel, we also receive the power through the blood of Christ to forgive even the most heinous sins that have been committed against us. Is there someone today that you need to forgive? Someone who has hurt you deeply? Someone towards whom you have a lot of bitterness and anger? As you pray the Lord's Prayer, it should be prompting you, and the Holy Spirit should be prompting you and me to have forgiveness in our hearts, even towards people who have impacted us very, very greatly. And you might say, I can't do that. It's just not in me. It is not in us. But as we follow the Word of God, the Word of God gives us the power to will and to do of His good pleasure. We simply stand on the Word of God. We simply do what the Word of God says. And we unilaterally forgive people in our lives or around us whom we're angry with. And we say in Jesus' name, I forgive you. And there's power in that. We might not feel like we've totally forgiven someone. But if we stand on the word of God and declare the word of God, it happens. We may feel anger towards someone at a certain point. We've forgiven them, but the anger comes back. We go back to our declaration, I forgive you in the name of Jesus. And after a period of time, we see that that powerful declaration frees us. It frees us from anger and bitterness and hate that imprisons us. So we've looked at two important petitions today in the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. God's name is hallowed as we honor his word and live according to it. But if we don't do that, we see all sorts of shenanigans that happens in our lives and the lives of others. And that is sin. And when we come in contact with sin, we call sin out. But we also forgive sin because our blessed Lord and Savior shed his blood for us sinners. And when we truly receive that gospel of forgiveness, we are empowered to pass it on to others. And I just want to remind you of one more thing today. 
and that is we are going to partake of the precious blood of Jesus poured out at Calvary's cross for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world and his broken body that was pierced with nails on the cross at Calvary. And as we partake of this blessed sacrament today, we also receive supernatural power to live godly lives, to proclaim God's truth, and to show supernatural forgiveness. So I invite you, all baptized believers who understand the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper to come and receive his forgiveness and the power to pass that forgiveness on to others. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And with all believers in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, let's rise and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Stay, stay, stay.